Hey there, what's up guys? Um, this is gonna be a little bit more sort of vlog style video uh, for you once again. Um, the topic today is about uh, sports on television and I'll tell you a little story. So I, I realized this when I wrote the uh, blog post that's uh, coming out today as well um, about this uh, subject. Back in 1993, I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Salt Lake City and it was in 1993 that um, they uh, decided to put all of the uh, Utah Jazz uh, NBA games on uh, uh, on uh, television for free. It was on uh, local television on a channel called um, KJZZ, uh, which had just been renamed to that. So the story behind this is that, um, as you may or may not know, uh, the uh, suburbs of uh, Salt Lake City were once excited about a uh, ABA team called the Utah Stars. The Stars lasted for a couple of years, actually won an ABA title, um, but uh, left not too long afterwards because of the problems that the ABA had. Um, there were people who wanted to move an NBA team over to Utah, um, and it finally did happen when the uh, New Orleans Jazz um, finally ran into far too many financial problems and decided to move their way over west. Um, and it was kind of an odd transplant. It wasn't really that great of a fit in with the city. I mean, even to this day, the nickname Jazz has absolutely nothing to do with Utah. It's kind of a strange thing. My understanding is that they kept the nickname mostly because they couldn't afford to get new uniforms, and so they had to sort of use the old ones and kind of make do. Um, the Jazz were really not a huge success in Utah in the beginning. In fact, I mean, up until the year I was born, 1984, the uh, Jazz frequently were, would play games over in Las Vegas. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about like maybe one or two. I'm talking about quite a few games every year. Sort of similar to the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers playing games in New Jersey that people forget about that happened in the mid-50s. Um, and uh, there was talk for a while about the Jazz moving completely over to uh, Las Vegas and just uh, abandoning Utah. Um, there was a, a used car salesman named Larry H. Miller who decided to purchase the Jazz um, and uh, keep them local to the community so that they could keep the uh, games there. And uh, it was pretty a pretty fortuitous decision by him because um, his purchase with the team wound up really, really turning into a, a great investment for him. Um, in large part because of the um, amount of international attention the NBA wound up getting as the um, 80s moved into the 1990s and as the uh, uh, league really started to grow. So it was in 1993 that Miller decided that uh, he'd had enough with these uh, contracts with, I think it was probably KSL that was showing jazz games. They were showing something like 24 or 25 games um, a season was all. And uh, he decided instead that it would be um, good business for him to um, invest in a television station. He chose Channel 14, which if you remember from the old days of television is UHF. Um, and uh, he renamed the local Channel 14 over to KJZZ. And uh, suddenly it became one of the most popular channels um, in the entire Salt Lake Valley because this is where you could see the jazz games. And they broadcast 82 games a year, plus all of the playoff games. This is back when you could do local broadcasts of playoff games. I don't think that's a thing in the NBA anymore, but um, I remember watching them there as well. Um, now, Miller was, you know, I mean, he had a lot of money, but he did know that he needed to be economical about things. So before 93, I have very few memories of watching the jazz on TV. I remember more listening to them on the radio with Hot Rod Hunley. When 93 came around, they would do the simulcast. I mean, the games that were telecast before, I think, were mostly simulcast as well. But this time it was like 82 games a year of simulcast listening to uh, Hot Rod Hunley and uh, Rod, Ron Boone. Um, and uh, that's sort of the approach that the Jazz took. Now, in the uh, mid-90s, when I was in like middle school, um, the Jazz became huge, and this is because they started to have success. I mean, they went to the NBA Finals two years in a row, and in the surrounding years were also extremely competitive going deep into the playoffs. Um, and uh, a lot, and a, I mean, really a lot of people, especially out in the suburbs where we live, paid a lot of attention to this team and a lot of attention to what was going on. The reason for that is because it was easy to watch. Everybody got the channel, right? And we could talk about it uh, during school. We could talk about it with everybody. You know, people's dads wanted to watch it with the kids and stuff. I mean, everybody knew about this team. It was to the point that uh, when um, Adam Keefe was going to be uh, traded, I can't remember if this was 98 or 99, it turned into a huge like front page news in the local papers. And uh, people were very, very upset about this. And how dare we do this to this fringe player who, you know, probably didn't really belong on the team uh, to begin with. Um, there was a lot of that that would go on um, and uh, a lot of that that uh, uh, transpired out of this fanhood. The uh, Jazz remained on KJZZ up until 2010. I was surprised when I learned that it was so late when they finally moved over to the uh, Rocky Mountain um, Fox Sports Network. Um, and uh, since then, they have been 100% on cable and have not been available for free. 
And uh, really, the unfortunate thing about this is that you lose a lot of that sense of community. Now, the reason why I bring this up now is because um, the Phoenix Suns have decided after watching the idiocy that is the Bali Sports um, slash Sinclair um, approach to the uh, regional sports networks, uh, the Phoenix Suns have decided to uh, take away their rights and uh, to just simply um, have games be broadcast locally for free on free television. This is the right thing to do, and this is exactly what sports should be doing. You want your product out there in front of people. You don't want to hide it behind paywalls so much. Television has been uh, feared by people in sports ever since, really, the late 40s. Um, sort of feared the way the radio was, and the thought is that, oh, people are just going to want to listen to the game at home or watch the game at home and won't be able to won't want to come to the park. Uh, they won't want to come to the arena or whatever it is. Now, that is true to an extent. It is true that especially in the early days of uh, televised baseball, and we're talking 1949, 1950, 51, and so on, that uh, showing too many games on uh, television would actually um, hurt the product. But you have to look in a little bit closer to see the reasons why these things happen. The reason why teams like the Boston Braves moved, for example, was not just because their games were on television, but also because the ballpark experience um, at Braves Field had become very, very problematic. Um, the same thing, and it's, it's sad, we don't want to say this, but the same thing is actually also true of the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers and of the New York Giants. The reason why these teams moved in part was because the ballparks were in disrepair and the uh, teams decided, the owners decided that it would be better to uh, transport the team elsewhere than to actually try to maintain an old ballpark. Um, that can be very, very controversial, especially in the case of the Dodgers. Um, so part of it is uh, the problem with television, but a bigger part, I think, has to do with other things that were keeping people away from the park. Um, I can even tell you today that I don't attend baseball games because the last time I went, it was 50 bucks a ticket, cost another 50 plus for parking. And when I went to try to park um, before the game started, I was in a traffic jam that lasted until the top of the second inning. Um, and it uh, wasn't exactly a great time for my family and I. So this is a this is a major problem. This is a major issue that um, takes place and that remains to this day. Um, there is a line of thinking that says that, oh, well, we can have television um, coverage of these sports that's sold to the highest bidder and that we can get extra revenue from this. I know that all Major League Baseball teams do this. In fact, I know um, for a fact that um, a very, very large chunk of revenue for baseball teams comes from television, not from uh, the uh, cost of uh, tickets at the gate or the cost of concessions or whatever it else it is you think is going on. Having said that, these teams really lose out in a lot of potential market because they hide their product behind a paywall. So you get extreme fans and people who, what we would consider to be whales in the business world, um, who uh, decide that uh, they're going to spend huge amounts of money on this team and they're going to make sure they have the right cable network and all this other stuff. But the problem is you don't get a lot of new fans, young fans, or fair weather fans because they're not going to pay money for this. They're not going to want to see this, you know. Maybe if the team's doing well, they'll follow it a little bit, but uh, chances are they're not going to look in uh, August and say, oh, we're in first place. I better buy that whatever special sports net package to get all the games, right? This is a major issue and it's a major problem. I can tell you that in our house, our children uh, do not watch sports on television because we don't have any television programs at all. I'm a cord cutter. I don't watch sports live on television really at all, and it's because I have a lot more fun uh, playing with simulations, writing articles, and making videos like this. I think it's a better use of my uh, free time than uh, running around and uh, trying to uh, watch somebody else play and trying to follow all of the inane and idiotic sports talk. Um, it is a problem, though, because if my children are interested in sports that they may not be interested in today, they have no way of discovering it. They have no way of watching baseball for the first time because their only option would be to pay huge amounts of money for a Major League Baseball package, either that or maybe watch a little clips, a few clips here or there on YouTube. There's no option to watch something that's live. If you had a great World Series game like, say, the 75 World Series Game 6 again, nobody would have the chance to watch it because... You know, it's uh, you're not you're not really connecting with your potential audience. People who have television, people who have the uh, antenna network set up, I suppose, could watch an exciting World Series game. But those of us who don't are kind of uh, blocked out unless we go the piracy route, which is not what I think Major League Baseball wants us to do. So the hope that I have here, and we'll see if this happens or not, the hope that I have here is that this will start a new trend and people who, the people who run these networks, or I'm sorry, these teams will start realizing that televising your games and making them accessible for everybody is actually a form of advertisement and is not necessarily like a potential revenue stream. 
And, you know, if you pay for cable television, satellite television, or anything like this, let me remind you that you are watching commercials. And in effect, what you were doing is you were paying a large amount of money for the uh, privilege of being directly advertised to by a number of advertisers who, in the old days, used to be the one paying for your broadcast. Kind of interesting how this has turned out, but uh, what happens as a result is the team and the network become filthy rich. And then you look back behind the curtain and you see that the team and the network are actually owned by the same people. Interesting how that works. Anyway, there you go. I would be interested to hear uh, uh, hear what uh, any of your opinions are on this subject, uh, if you think that I'm crazy or not, or uh, what memories you might have. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.